So now, good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for coming. My name is Amy Ruderbush, and I'm the president of EHOP. On behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome you to our fifth annual Know Your Vote pre-town meeting forum. We'd like to, thank, to start off by thanking the town and the schools for, for providing tonight's venue. Thank you to the HCAM crew for broadcasting and recording the event so residents can watch at their home at their convenience. I'd like to recognize the EHOP board members that are here tonight helping out in various capacities. Vice President Tara Sanda, who will be moderating the Q&A later tonight. Treasurer Cindy Bernardo could not be here tonight due to a family um, emergency. Uh, board members Nanda Barker-Hook, uh, Amanda Fargiano, who is in the back, Mary Poella at the welcome table, and Christy Willison. It's hard to believe it's been almost 10 years. Oh, can you Nanda. Yeah. Ten, but EHOP was founded in the fall of 2007 under the name Educate Hopkinton. And at that time, we had just about 100 email subscribers. And we have grown considerably, and we now have over 770 subscribers. Although we did originally focus on school budget topics, we quickly saw how the town and school budgets are intertwined, and we expanded our coverage um, let's see, to include all town meeting and town election issues. However, many people still thought of us as only being about school issues, so we decided to change our name to EHOP, which stands for Educate, Engage, Empower, Hopkinton. We became a 501c4 nonprofit civic league in 2012. Recognizing that it's impossible for every citizen to become fully informed on every issue, EHOP's mission is to provide timely and factual information about key town manners, matters with the goal of increasing trans transparency and fostering civic engagement. We host a website that is a virtual town time capsule of Hopkins and Town meetings past and present. If you can't remember how the town voted on a particular issue, you can easily look it up on our website. We send an e-newsletter every couple of weeks, and we have a large following on social media, especially Facebook, where we have 930 followers right now. And we'd love to hit over 1,000 by town meeting next week, so if you please like us on Facebook and spread the word. We also have over, 100, or sorry, over 800 followers on tw Twitter, and more recently we've started using Instagram, LinkedIn, and the Nextdoor app. I'd like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Just real briefly. Um, oh, with your, you have mic there. Hi, Brian Hurt, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Norman Kumalo, Town Manager. Elaine Lazarus, Director of Land Use and Town Operations. Ken Weissmandel, Chairman of the Planning Board. Bob Dubinsky, Chairman of Park and Rec. Lori Nickerson, Chair of the School Committee. <coughs> Kathy McLeod, Superintendent. Denise Hildreth, Director of Youth and Family Services. Tom Garabedian, town moderator. Thank you all for sharing your time with us. And please note that Ken Weismantle has to leave early for a planning board meeting at 7.30. So we'll give first priority to any planning and zoning questions that we receive tonight. All right, now for some important town meeting information. Okay, town meeting begins Monday, May 1st in the middle school auditorium at 7 p.m. There are 63 questions on the warrant this year. Town meeting typically adjourns at 11 p.m and continues on consecutive eating evenings from 7 to 11 p.m. until all articles are voted. In recent years, town meeting has lasted two to four nights. All registered voters are invited, and you must at attend the meeting in person in order to vote. A quorum of 100 people is needed for any business which calls for the appropriation of money at any town meeting. All right, so as mentioned, we have 63 articles on the warrant this year, and at this time, I'd just like to call out some of the articles that have drawn the most attention as we posted on social media this week. So Article 10 is the operating budget, which is a little over $82 million, which includes the Hopkinton Public Schools budget of $42 million. Uh, the town and school budgets are voted together in one article. All right, the next one is Article 19, which is the pay-as-you-go capital expenses, um, some of which include the re repair of the Lake Maspinock Dam, the Hayden Road drainage pipe, replacement of police vehicles, a garage door at the Main Street Fire Station, system-wide security upgrades for the schools, system-wide technology upgrades for the schools, Hopkins School HVAC assessment and upgrades. All right, then the next is Article 24, is the traffic calming measures on Hayden Row for a little over a million dollars. A similar article, um, similar article failed a couple of years ago at town meeting, but they they've, have a revised article. Article 27 is a feasibility study to renovate or replace the Elmwood School for 600,000, part of which would be re reimbursed by the MSBA. Article 31H is the Fruit Street uh, building bathroom and concession uh, area, paid for through CPC funds, 
400,000. And then there's a, another article is the zoning article number 38 for a temporary moratorium on the non-medical marijuana esta establishments. Okay, so there are several ways that residents can participate tonight. If anyone here in person can step up to the mic, or you can write your question on an index card and hand it to any hot board member, and we all have name tags on. If you're watching at home, you can email questions to knowyourvote at ehop01748.org or use the hashtag HopTM17 on Twitter. This year, for the first time, we're trying Facebook Live, so you can watch our live feed on Facebook, and you can type your questions directly into the comments section on Facebook. This is our first time trying that, but feel, please feel free to give it a try. And I'm now going to turn the floor over to Tara Sanda from eHop, who's going to facilitate the question and answer portion of the evening. Hello. Thank you for that introduction, Amy. Um, and thank you to our panelists for coming tonight and for our first ever live audience for Know Your Vote. Um, in the past, we have done this at the HCAM studios, and it was very successful, but we never had a live audience. And we had call-ins, we had emails, but we really wanted, we had two very successful forums this year called Spotlights, one on traffic and one on water. So we wanted to build on those forums and get people engaged and get people talking. This year, um, another change is we are be, the event is being hosted by the town, and EHOP is moderating the event. Uh, also new this year, as Amy mentioned, is we are streaming live on Facebook. So if you look over there, panelists, you can all wave at Facebook. Mm -hmm. So people will be able to... <laughs> Those aren't enthusiastic waves. <laughs> um, so people are going to be able to ask us live questions or give us thumbs up or whatever as we go through the night. Um, so now um, we're going to get to the questions. Um, I've got one that is all ready, and then as you guys have questions, just step up to the mic, and you can add any of your own questions. Um, as in any of these forums, there's a code of conduct, so please step up to the mic and wait for your turn. Um, ask your question. You can address it to one of the panelists. You're allowed one follow-up question. If there's nobody behind you and you have another question, feel free to ask it. Um, but if there's a line behind you, we ask that you just get back in line if you have something to follow up with. Um, our first question um, is about town meeting and a general question. Um, and it's about making an amendment. And if everybody remembers at special town meeting, um, we didn't have that many articles, but there was a lot of discussion and there were a lot of amendments and discussions about amendments. Um, the question is, is there a way that a citizen can make an amendment prior to town meeting so that when we get to town meeting, it's already there to be reviewed and discussed? And what is that process? Well, at this point, uh, there is no opportunity to make an amendment before town meeting. But an individual who wants to make an amendment at town meeting would simply approach the microphone be recognized by the town moderator. Uh, we ask that any amendment that is made be written so that someone isn't uh, just trying to think of, of something on the fly. We want something that's uh, formally written. Uh, the individual makes the amendment. The audiovisual folks will, will actually incorporate the amendment on the screen so that the entire audience can see the amendment in context. Uh, the amendment would need to be seconded by someone, uh, some other uh, registered voter at the meeting. At that point, the amendment is open for discussion. Uh, eventually, uh, someone will call a question which s closes debate on the amendment and a vote is taken. If the vote is positive, uh, then the amendment is incorporated into the, uh, into the article that was before town meeting. Discussion then continues on the uh, on the amendment as on, on the article as amended, uh, at which point uh, some someone can ask that the question can be called. Debate is is then uh, curtailed, and a vote is taken on the article as amended. So that's essentially the process. Okay. Can I add to that? Yes, please. <laughs> Everything the moderator said is 100% accurate. We do have resources available in advance of town meeting. If somebody's interested in making an amendment on town meeting floor and they're thinking about making, them, making an amendment on town meeting floor, they can come to the town manager's office in advance of town meeting and talk about the process a little bit further. And also we can pro 
perhaps offer some advice and input about how to get it done. Thank you. Okay, I have one more kind of general town meeting question that was emailed into us, and it is, why are the town and school budgets voted together in one article? Can a resident make an amendment to, a, to part the two budgets? <laughs> I, I don't honestly don't know the history be, uh, you know, behind the, the, the reason for a combination of the budgets, but uh, you know someone who wants to make an amendment, certainly an amendment to the budgets is free to make an amendment on the floor. Um, of course, if, if it involves increasing the budget, then they, they also have to present uh, the means to, to supply the additional funds that might be required for any part of that budget. Um, and I believe we could also entertain a, a motion from the floor, again, to be debated, to be seconded and debated uh, for a separation of the two budgets. So it is possible. Okay. Yes, Norman? Mr. Kamala? In addition, um, the combined budget article is predicated on the principle that we are one town, we are one solution, we are relying on the same taxpayers. Um, Practically speaking, as we have seen in the motion, we appropriately identify the school budget. Uh, similarly, we identify the town budgets and the enterprise funds. In addition, at town meeting, the school committee chair, the superintendent, the town manager, the board of selectmen chair are all available to present and speak to the participants at the town meeting with regard to their respective budgets. Again, the concept is predicated on we are one town, we have one solution, and we are all looking at the same taxpayers. Thank you. Um, our next uh, question came in. Um, Mr. Westerling, this might be for you. Um, it's a question about funds and how the timely manner that they are used. Um, it said, once funds are approved at town meeting, what is the time limit to start spending those approved funds? For example, 1.5 million was approved in 2016 for a new water tower. What is the status of this project? You can go right up to the, yep. Good evening, John Westerling, Director of Public Works. I will defer the, the first part of that question as to how long do you have to spend it. Uh, but as far as an update on the water tank project, we are opening bids this Thursday at 11 a.m. At that point, if the bids are under our appropriation, we will coordinate with the schools on when that construction will start. Uh, we want to coordinate with the schools because the demolition of the existing tank, we want to make sure that school is out of session for the summer. The demolition will occur through the summer, and then construction will begin. It's probably a six to eight month construction process. Mr. Kamala, do you want to address the, the first part of the question? Yes. Um, and in general, any specific appropriation at town meeting can exist for two years, after which it may revert to the general fund. There are exceptions. Number one, if in the motion approved at town meeting, there's a specific period for spending the money identified. Secondly, if there is a contract that encumbers the money to go beyond two years, that can happen. Another exception is that with borrowings, that two-year period does not apply. Thank you. So to build on that question, um, in 2015, we approved 500000 at annual town meeting and an additional 500000 at special town meeting for a pavilion and indoor facility with bathroom and concessions totaling one million for this project. The project has yet to begun, but we are now being asked to allocate an additional 400,000 from CPC funding for the same project. Why are these additional funds needed and why hasn't the project started? Can you pass the mic? That is a very good question. <laughs> so a little explanation. The uh, 500000 that was uh, CPC funded 
was for an outdoor pavilion, restroom, and storage area. The other 500000 was for an indoor practice facility. After we formed a subcommittee of the sporting groups in town, we recognized that the CPC funds and the building wasn't large enough. In addition to the infrastructure that needed to take place as far as plumbing and electric. <clears throat> so similar to Mr. Westerly, we are opening bids this week for the, indoor, for the uh, CPC funded pavilion and we're hopeful at town meeting to get the additional 400,000 to make that building a little bigger. Again, the sports group's direction. The, so that encompasses the CPC funds. The outdoor pavilion we recognized as also being too small for the $500,000 that special town meeting awarded us. So we're in the process of studying a larger building and the potential funds needed to go ahead and again fulfill the sports group's desires. Okay, just to follow up with you, so since the original plan that was brought to town meeting, so the indoor and the outdoor has, has been enlarged? Correct. And okay. at town meeting that we believe that the two buildings, CPC funded and also town funded, could share an adjoining wall. With the help of Mr. Kamala and legal counsel, we recognized that that couldn't happen or we might sacrifice our CPC funding. So it kind of set us in a new direction. And that kind of answers the question why it hasn't started yet. Yeah. 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 Hi, follow up to that question. Sorry, just came in. Um, so someone asked, what will be the use of the indoor space? Is it gonna be specific for specific sports or? What's kind of the intent of the indoor space? So again, through the subcommittee that we had with the sporting groups in town, mm -hmm. we hope to encompass soccer, football, cheerleading, um, wrestling, almost every sport except for basketball at this particular point, because again, it was the subcommittee's thought that with the new school going online and center school that we might have enough indoor practice facilities to fill the town needs. But it's important at Fruit Street to recognize that the participants who are using outdoor laboratory facilities, kind of difficult for young ladies. There also was not really a, a structure to, to help with the inclement weather that might come in. So this was primarily done for safety reasons. And it'll also help us prepare funds for the replacement of those turf fields because we recognize we can kind of up the rent a little bit to outsource out-of-town activities mm -hmm. once the Hopkinton needs are met. Okay. And there's one more. Sorry. There's one more question. Um, do you foresee coming back to town meeting for any money, or do you think that this is going to complete the project? The CPC funded mm -hmm. uh, portion of the building, you know, we don't believe that given our engineering's estimates, we'll need any additional funds. We have, as I mentioned, commenced the study for the indoor practice facility, which was originally going to be 50 by 75 feet. Quickly, we understood that that wasn't large enough. Mm -hmm. So we, in the process of the study, to determine what the cost of that building might be, so there would be an opportunity for us to come back to town meeting. Okay. Thank you. Sure. One thing I want to remind the audience, um, Unlike town meeting, we can go in any order of article. So if you want to bring up an article that's, you know, article number 56, feel free to come up and talk about that at any time because we can jump back and forth. Um, the next question that we have collected is about the tax underwrite, unless you have a question. Okay, perfect. Muriel, Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street. Um, on the Fruit Street facility, um, did I understand that we don't know the total cost yet for the facility because we're, we're still studying it? Uh, just or is to, it just two to clarify, facilities? correct, two facilities. The amenities building, which the drawing is up on the screen right now, includes uh, the restrooms, a concession stand, a larger storage area than what we anticipated, and the, the outdoor pavilion. Our estimates from the engineer, engineers believe that building is going to be somewhere between eight hundred and nine hundred thousand dollars, with the additional infrastructure needed. So, depending upon the bids that open this week, 
we're fairly confident that's going to cover the bill. And that is a completely CPC funded? Correct. Um, so I, just one more question. Um, the sports organizations that are interested in making these improvements, do they have a contribution to the buildings that you're planning to put up? They will when they use the facilities. So when they rent the fields, a contribution will be made to the Fruit Street Fund, which will primarily be the, the source to go ahead and replace the turf in the next six to eight years. Just, uh, just a comment. Um, I think that it would be nice to entertain those same groups making a contribution to these uh, planned buildings. Okay, so our next question is about the tax underwrite. And I was wondering if you could please explain what a tax underwrite is, as listed in Article 16. Will residents' taxes go down if they vote in favor of this article? I'll let anybody answer. That's a tough question. I think, put simply, the concept of an underwrite keeps the taxpayers' money in the taxpayers' pockets. Technically speaking, through Proposition 2 and a half laws, there is a limit that has been set with regard to how the town increases taxes. Over the years, through the guidance and the leadership of the Board of Selectmen, different town boards and committees, appropriations committee, the town has established an excess levy. This is money that normally the town could tax, tax from the taxpayers' pockets. However, the town hasn't done so. As you've seen in past years, the town's tax impact has been less than 2.5%. And therefore, that excess money, which is still in the taxpayer's pocket, based on the amount that has been established through this motion, will remain in the taxpayer's pockets. Thank you, Mr. Kamala. So specifically with regard to whether the underwrite will reduce taxes, I think the simple answer is the money remains in the taxpayers' pockets and the intention is not to therefore reduce the money taxed in this particular year, but however, going forward, that money now permanently remains in the taxpayers' pocket. Okay, and this is a question that came along with that question. Um, this is not from us. So it says, should the town be required to reduce the amount of real estate and personal property taxes to be assessed for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2017, by $1.5 million? Again, this isn't a question from us, so. In, in fact, that is the question that will be posed as the ballot question for the underwrite. In other words, as I said earlier, we will be asking the taxpayers to reduce the allowable tax limit by $1.5 million. And that $1.5 million is coming from the excess levy. Can you repeat that one more time? Say that one more time. Just what you just said. I'm just trying to digest it in case, because I have other questions that might relate to it, but I want to make sure. Yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. The, I'm looking for the, the simplest mathematical explanation of the question. At this point, let's assume the, the town can additionally tax its residents by another through $3.2 million. Here is what the underwrite does. If set at the amount of $1.5 million, it means $3.2 million 
minus 1.5 remains on the table as what the town could tax permanently. We have reset the tax rate that is set by the limit statutorily at $1.5 million less. Can, can I try this from a different angle? Sure. So about um, 10 years ago, nine years ago, the recession kicked in, eight years ago, whenever it was. When the recession kicked in, the board at the time said, okay, we can't come out and ask for a full 2.5% because folks are struggling to pay the bills right now. So that year, I think we raised the taxes, and please don't quote me on this, I think we raised the taxes about a half a percent. Maybe it was 0.4%. So instead of raising 2.5%, which is allowed by law, we only raised it a half a percent. The next year, I think we raised it a point or a point and a half. And so for a few years, we didn't go the full 2.5%. So what that did was it built up what's called the excess levy, meaning we could have taxed 2.5 times 4 years, whatever those numbers were that we didn't go up 2.5 those years, right? And so that built up about a million and a half dollar uh, excess levy. And then about five years ago, we had a, maybe four years ago now, we had an underride. And the underride passed at the ballot. The underride reset that number, which was a million five, and it pulled it back down to a half million. In other words, we could have gone and taken that million and a half, or raised taxes a million and a half dollars, without having an override, that dreaded word, right? We didn't have to have an override to raise and go get more money from the, from the taxpayers. So we had an underride, we put an underride in place so that that couldn't happen. It creates some discipline, fiscal discipline, within the Board of Selectmen and within town government to make sure we can't go out and spike taxes one year 9% and not have an override, because that's technically what you could do. So here we are now five years later. We still continue to have fiscal discipline in our community. We try to spend what we need, but not more than that. So we now have an excess levy because of those years that we didn't tax the full two and a half, and a few more years where we didn't tax, but that excess levy itself also grows at a two and a half percent number annually. So it's kind of like compound interest in some respects. So now we have about a $3 million excess levy today. Okay? And we're suggesting that we consider putting an underwrite on the ballot. We have. We put the underwrite on the ballot to lower that excess levy to a million and a half dollars. That means going forward we can't go out and tax the taxpayers three million bucks, but if we needed a million and a half because something happened, like Town Hall imploded, Right? We could go get some money and we could do those sorts of things. So it allows some flexibility, but it also puts discipline in place so that we're not constantly, or we, not, we couldn't, you know, without a lot of discussion, go out and tax the taxpayers a whole lot more. So that's the reason why we propose the underride. That's why we've done it in the past, and I hope that helps explain sort of the situation today. Thanks. So with that being said, we do get this levy, excess levy, down to 1.5, we could next year have an override. If something were to happen, we needed the money. So if next year, if next year we needed, um, let's say, okay, we had a problem with town hall, right? So it's not going to happen. Please don't write this down. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Let's use it as an example. Let's say next year we need $3 million because town hall did implode and we have to do something else. We, if, we, if we put the underride through this year, we can tax... 1.5 of that without asking for an override. If we need to go above the 1.5 plus the 2.5 that's allowed by law next year, we would have to ask for an override to get to that $3 million number if that's what we have to get to. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes. Thank you. In, in fact, to be precise, Brian, Brian is correct. However, before the town gets to the override, there is a remaining I think 1.5 million in our excess levy. Right. We'll have to go beyond that before we get to the override. Mm -hmm. okay, so Mr. Wisemantle has to leave pretty soon, so I do want to get our zoning question into you. Um, and this is in regards to restaurants and parking. Um, can you please provide a brief overview of this article and the rationale behind it? Certainly. Uh, <clears throat> this article would define the term restaurant and clarify the bylaw with respects to such uses. These changes would also revise the parking requirements by establishing separate parking requirements for restaurants with customer seating and those without. The parking requirement also takes into account outdoor seating, which the current bylaw does not do. 
you and I and everyone thinks we know what a restaurant is, but unfortunately our bylaw as written really didn't define it very well. And uh, there was a lot of confusion in uh, some recent litigation, uh, and therefore we needed to properly define in our bylaw restaurants. And we will have one definition of restaurants uh, for, and it'll take care of and make sure that all of our existing restaurants are not non-conforming. Uh, the, the part of the problem was in the litigation of is it restaurant or retail when you buy something like takeout and you get a pizza and you take it home, is that a restaurant or is that you know, a retail store? So we've redefined restaurants and we should solve that, that problem. Okay, and one follow-up question. Is there a regulation on proximity of parking spaces to restaurants? For example, will the new zoning allow downtown restaurants to claim parking spots in the new zoning, oh, sorry, in municipal lots that are a walk away, or must the spaces be about the property? There's uh, a, another bylaw that allows for uh, off-site parking, and that requires a special permit by the planning board. So I guess the question is, parking does not have to be right at the restaurant as long as we have another acceptable spot for the parking. Okay, thank you. And then, Mr. Westerling, you also have to leave pretty soon. So we've got a question about the Fruit Street blending facility for $1.5 million. Can you please explain to us what it is and why do we need it? Thankfully, I don't have to describe an underwrite. <laughs> but the gentleman did a very good job. Uh, two years ago, town meeting appropriated $100,000 for the design of a well blending facility on Fruit Street. And the reason that we need that is that well number two has higher levels of iron and manganese than DEP likes to see. So what we're going to do is combine the water, we're going to blend the water between well two with wells one and six. And wells one and six, they have better wa water quality, they have a lower level of iron and manganese. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to dilute the water to bring the iron and manganese levels within compliance for Mass DEP standards. And this is all approved by Mass DEP, so what we're doing here is, is uh, in conformance with the regulations. What that will give us is a central blending facility at our well number six. It will also help us to achieve uh, up to the safe yield of well number two, which is 270,000 gallons per day. So we, we really want to ensure that we're able to provide the most water out of that well that we can. It will uh, provide an improvement in chemical injection and allow better chemical feed, storage, and dosing. It will uh, provide us with a new blending facility, which will bring us to, into compliance with groundwater rule compliance monitoring. And what that does is it basically allows us to test the water coming out of the well before it gets to that first customer. We will also be upgrading our SCADA system. We will be installing new water piping because basically this is just water piping underground to blend that water together. We will be making well pump station improvements. The existing wells are some 40 years old, those at wells uh, one and two, so we're gonna be replacing those. And then finally, we'll be adding VFDs, or variable frequency drives, which will help us to increase the water that we're pumping out of those wells as we need it. And one follow-up. Why is there such a discrepancy between the water sources and what is in them? Are they hitting different veins? Are they, I don't know. Yes, if you look at our wells all across town, um, of which we have eight, they are in different parts of town, and in those different parts of town, even the ones that are close to one another, they may have different qualities of water that are being pumped from them. And that all depends on the soils that the water passes through before it gets to the wells, uh, depends on the, the depth of the aquifer or the depth of the groundwater. So there's a lot of variables that go into the water quality that we pump out of the ground. Thank you, Mr. Westerling. You're welcome. Okay, the next article we would like to take a look at is Article 27, which is the Elmwood Feasibility Study. 
Um, we'd just like to know what is the purpose of this feasibility study? Um, I'll let you start with that. So the purpose of the feasibility study is to determine the um, either replacement or renovation of the Elmwood School. Um, before we can do anything, we need to apply uh, or submit an SOI to the MSBA. And if we are invited in to their um, timeline, then there is a good possibility that they will help fund the feasibility study. This is something that we've been looking at and talking about for almost 10 years. And always the Elmwood School came second to the center school um, in terms of priority. So although we have submitted an, S an SOI or a statement of interest four times already for the Elmwood School, we were always asked by the MSBA, is this your priority project? And the answer was always no. Our priority project is the center school. We were hopeful that they might have been addressed at the same time. At one point, there was some thought that the solution could be, in fact, at the Elmwood School site. And that's one of the reasons that initially, or one of the submissions was a joint submission, um, because the school district was always looking at the possibilities. So we are now faced with a school that has been aging over the past significantly enough to submit an SOI for well over 10 years. Um, as we know from having just where we are in the Marathon School project, it takes a long time to get to the point where we're actually replacing a school. Uh, so the reason that this article is before the town is to seek their support to take that first step, which is really to look at whether or not, first of all, whether we will be invited in by the MSBA. So the SOI has been submitted um, in order to meet the deadline that was required. Um, but the potential cost to that project, and I say potential um, because unless we're invited in with the MSBA, we wouldn't be moving forward with this project. And if we are invited in, um, then we could, um, there could be as much of, as a 50% um, um, partnership in terms of providing funding from the MSBA, which would reduce this by, potentially by half, probably more like 40% because that's what we're looking at with the uh, current school project. Right. Um, the only thing that I would add to what Dr. McLeod has stated is that it, this, it, this truly is the feasibility study. This is not a new school project. So the first step in any of these school projects has been the feasibility phase. And with the current Marathon School, we didn't have MSBA funding to cover any of the feasibility study because we had already extinguished those funds in the first failed school project that had happened years before. So in this particular case, there, there is no um, Elmwood School Solution failed project. So there's nothing for us to believe that we wouldn't be seeing reimbursement from the MSBA in some percentage on this um, $600,000. But what I think that I've heard from community members in confusion is that why are we building another school when we have a school that we're currently building? And that's not what's happening with this article. What this article is looking at what can be done with Elmwood School? Can it be renovated? Will it need to be replaced? What solutions do we have for the fact that we have such high enrollments? There, there are a number of things that we are looking at with this. And the MSBA doesn't give us any indication of when they're going to allow you into the process. So for all we know, it could be years down the road that we're actually allowed into the process. But if you don't have that appropriation ready at the time, then you also um, extend the time period and could miss some of the deadlines that the MSBA puts into place because you don't have the appropriation ready and you may also require a special town meeting. So when we made the decision as a committee to move forward with the statement of interest and brought that before the Board of Selectmen, it seemed most prudent to put forth this article. But again, none of this money would be appropriated if we're not invited into the process. Right. You kind of hit upon this a little bit, um, but at special town meeting, we voted, we approved the expansion of the Marathon School um, based on the new uh, figures that came in for students. Are you concerned about Elmwood and Hopkins with those new projections? 
Um, I st the, certainly, the school committee is looking at enrollments at all of our buildings based on the projections. I mean, obviously, any of the large classes that will start at the Marathon School will bubble up to the other school buildings eventually, like we plan on all of our children moving up through the system. Um, we are actively looking as a committee at what we can do creatively about enrollments between all the school buildings. And um, it'll be an important project for the school committee in the years to come in terms of looking for community feedback, administrative feedback, teacher feedback on what we can do to be creative with the spaces we already have and where we see um, a bubble or a crunch that's going to cause us pain. Um, particularly the Marathon School, once that opens, will open up four classrooms in Elmwood that are currently being used by the preschool. So that will alleviate some pressure for a period of time. but. The projections that we're seeing are con constantly increasing for at least the next five to eight years. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough timeline to predict. I mean, our um, state um, agency that does the predictions for us has not been successful in being right on point in years past. And we as a community, they have acknowledged and the MSBA has acknowledged are seeing unprecedented growth. So we're trying to be as proactive as possible and be creative as possible in how we're using all of our school buildings. And then one more question about that. Um, has there been any talk, and this is for the town and for the school committee, um, of possibly holding on to center school as expansion space if we need to start construction on Elmwood School or anywhere else? So once the school district releases that building and moves into Marathon, it becomes, um, it goes, reverts back to the town and the school, the school district and the school committee has no control over the use of that building. And that returns to the board of selectmen and the town manager to make decisions along with, I believe, a subcommittee that's been created to look at the uses of that building. You're not, you're agreeing with So the board did vote uh, recently within the last month or two to um, set up a subcommittee to start looking at center school and what the options will be going forward. It's in the historic district. We need to be very sensitive to that. And uh, the, you know, the use of o uh, overflow, I uh, hadn't frankly thought of that until just now. Uh, interesting idea and maybe something we have to consider as we move forward. But there'll be all kinds of, uh, there'll be a full process that we have to go through uh, in line with any town asset that we would take, take under, you know, advisement a lot of different input. And we have a question from the audience. I do. Uh, Meena Bharat, 239 Street. Um, I have actually three questions. The first is, how old is the Elmwood School? And, um, you know, can you share some details on what we see as the lifespan of a school building? Um, the second question I have is, with regard to the $600,000 projection, can you share some details on how that number was, you know, how did you come up to that number, uh, the rationale behind that projection? And the third is, what is it that you are, um, uh, you know, the outcome of the feasibility study? Can you share some details, like what would be some of the results, the time, time span for that? How would it be shared with the community? So I, I, we're, this is going to be a tag team effort, Dr. McLeod, for sure. Um, the age of the building. <laughs> Ten years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the new school then? I believe, I believe it was built in the 50s, but I could be wrong. Um, but I'm going based on architecture and the age of some of the infrastructure that we've looked at individually. Um, Areas of concern within the building are the HVAC systems, the windows being replaced. We did replace the roof three years ago, so the roof is not a concern currently. Um, there's aging plumbing. We've, um, if anyone's been following any of our lead water tests, there's been those issues happening within the building, as well as the functionality and um, flow of the building for now 21st century education. So, you know, the gymnasium floor is of a material that wouldn't be currently used anymore. Um, there's just various aspects. I mean, the four classrooms that are going to be opening up once the preschool is in are not actually permanent classrooms. They're trailers, two of the four. Um, so there, there certainly, for anyone that has children in that building, which I actually do, there are 
massive swings in temperature based on where you are in the building, um, which is also a concern for terms of efficiency and heating and things of that nature. What we're trying to also avoid is getting to the situation that we're currently in with center school, where there is such overcrowding that we no longer have an art room. We no longer have a music room. The principal no longer is using our office. We've had many plumbing and leaking issues this year, all of which are being dealt with to get through to the new building. We don't want to be in a situation with a school where it's in such deterioration that the students are experiencing that kind of disruption in their day just based on the fact that we weren't proactive enough with the facility. So to get back to um, the $600,000, so we, we, we recently obviously went through a feasibility study, so we have a very good handle on how much those cost um, because we had to go to the town a few years ago to get the money for the marathon school now. Um, in addition, we are working closely with, I believe, those same project managers to get an estimate on what a feasibility study would be at Elmwood. And like Dr. McLeod spoke to, the Elmwood site was looked at during the review of what would happen for a new center school solution. So that particular estimate, we feel very confident in based on that, those current um, projects that are undergoing and on top of the fact that the same project teams that we're working with could provide us those estimates. Um, I'm forgetting what the third part of the question was. The, the output of the study. Um, the timing of the output of the study is actually going to depend on when we get invited into the process. So we don't have a real great timeline for you on that because it's going to be determined by the MSBA bringing us in and what would kick off a feasibility study process. So if the MSBA doesn't invite us in this year, it, we wouldn't have anything to report other than what the status is with the MSBA. And the statement of interest that we filed at the beginning of April is only good for a year and then it expires. If the MSBA does not invite you into their process during that year, we have to reapply. And that means that the school committee at the time needs to re-vote on whether or not they have an interest in doing so, and the Board of Selectmen also have to approve it. So there are many steps in this process. Um, if we were <laughs> invited in, I, I don't actually know how long it takes from that time period to actually get the feasibility study done to get information back to the community. But what I would say is that we, six months? What I will say is that this particular project was so successful in its communication and its community input that I have extreme confidence that if we were to be invited into a process again with the amount of intellect and volunteerism within this town that would take part again in another project like that, I believe that we would be able to put forth the same education for the town that they could feel good about a solution that everyone had some input in. Um, that goes without my being on the committee again next year, but I would hope that we would have the same expectation as townspeople to get the same type of information that we required in building the marathon school. So. Oh, sure. Oh, so the school committee um, and Dr. McLeod, and I will actually give more credit to Dr. McLeod and our director of finance, drafted um, fast facts for all of our capital articles that will be passed out at town meeting and they'll also be attached with the um, capital article online. Um, they are copies in the back, so you can get definitely more detailed information on both the Elmwood School Solution as well as the other capital articles that we're presenting at town meeting. Audience question? Go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> Irfan Nasrullah, 211 Winter Street. Um, still trying to get my head around the Fruit Street um, Athletic Complex. Um, so I guess what I heard is that there's been $1.4 million that's been allocated um, between the CPC and money that's been voted on. Um, and so we have the, the snack shack, and then we have a pavilion for athletic events, correct? So just a little edification. 
there was $500,000 of CPC funds mm -hmm. that was dedicated to an amenities building, provide uh, some protection for the, the children, lavatories, storage area, and a small concession stand. Mm -hmm. Separate article was a $500,000 loan from the town to build an indoor practice facility. Once we engaged those projects, we understood that those two buildings could not share a wall or any economies of scale. And that took some time with the town. <clears throat> we are asking for an additional $400,000 of CPC funds mm -hmm. to be put towards the amenity building because we recognized, one, it was too small, and two, the infrastructure that was needed there exceeded what our budget was. So 1.4 has not been allocated. 500,000, 500,000, we're asking for another four. Interesting to note that when the high school fields somewhat were unplayable this spring, Fruit Street was able to be a great fail-safe for that for because of the indoor turf, but lacked that infrastructure for laboratory storage facilities or some sort of cover in case there was rain or a thunderstorm. So when you said the amenities building, you're talking about the restrooms, the concessions, and storage. Certainly not a snack shack, but I can appreciate your uh, I'm, I'm, your thought. I'm trying to get my head around it. Sure, trying to sure, understand sure, exactly sure. what it is. And this is going to cost 500000 500000 plus additional ask of 400000 of CPC funds. Okay. Thank you. So I need to jump back quickly to the Elmwood feasibility. I got a Facebook question. Um, it just asks, a follow-up to that, is there a projection of need for the high school and middle school within the next two years? Uh, well, we, we, so what I will say is we did meet with all the principals this year, and I'm forgetting what exact meeting it was been, but it's been since January where we discussed with each of our principals what the enrollment projections were for the coming years, being that we had updated numbers from NESDAQ, as well as what the principals were seeing within the buildings. Um, there's been no specific discussion around the middle school and high school needs at this point. So um, in terms of capacity, um, what is nice about the middle school and the high school, in addition to what Lori has said, is the flexibility around scheduling. And so when we look at capacity, we know that from the NESDEC results that K-8 is the, the biggest influx over the next five to eight years, as Lori has described. But then the students are staying with us. And we're excited about that. They're not leaving at eighth grade, by and large. So we know that over the years, we're going to need the capacity at the middle school and the high school. But as Lori mentioned, when, when questioned with the principals, they have some ways of looking at scheduling that can allow more flexibility for class size within the middle school and the high school that we're not able to do at the, at the elementary level. And so, no, we are not worried about capacity at the middle school or the high school over the next 10-year um, projection, uh, including the numbers that we've been... I mean, one creative thought that I'll share that Mr. Bishop um, shared was even flexing start and end time, right? So we can handle more kids if we have a longer day um, with some kids coming earlier and some kids leave. So, you, right, that just makes sense. So there are ways that we can look at creatively using the space um, so that we do not feel that we are going to be constrained by our current buildings, the middle school and the high school. And just to add to that, I think the one thing that gets lost in translation when you're looking at the elementary schools is that the size of our classes is vitally important for elementary age students versus middle and high school students. Um, and especially when you're talking high school, when you get into electives where the class size is very based on the desires of the students. Um, whereas when you're talking kindergarten and first grade classroom, second and third grade classroom, fourth and fifth grade classroom, the size of the class per teacher really impacts the educational model and how successful we are as a district with teaching our students and, and having them have the aptitude that they've had so far. And we as a district have always valued having smaller class sizes so that they have that attention. So we, we have focused that attention there. Thank you. Um, Quickly to answer, I think there was an audience question, when Elmwood originally opened, right? We found the answer. 
diligent work background here. 1965 is when it opened, and then the last renovation was 2006. Does that sound about right? Hopefully. What about the roof? Oh, that was. The roof was three years ago. Yeah. Okay, I think we're going to move on. Yes. <laughs> Our next topic is the EMC lighting um, for 250,000. We'll be adding, or the town is asking to add lighting at EMC Park. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little about this. So when EMC Park opened, there was a moratorium on lights for an eight-year period of time. And given the increase of uh, number of players, Park and Rec has partnered with Baseball Little League to go ahead and add lights to the center field. So we've done a real quick study to say that we could put lights on that field, which would also augment the new uh, Marathon School's parking lot for some of the overflow they have at their events. So as a board, we requested CPC funds to provide that lighting. I have one follow-up question, and it's kind of personal, but because um, I live on the Fruit Street fields, and Fruit Street, the turf fields, so, and the lighting that is provided right now is the temporary lighting that's very low. My little guys are lacrosse players, so when they have to play at night, they can't see the lacrosse balls coming straight at their face with the, the, light, the height of the lights as they are. Do you have plans in the future to provide lighting at Fruit Street? So the lighting at Fruit Street was large in part done to go ahead and accommodate the school sports that migrated over to Fruit Street. And the only way that we could do that, along with supporting the youth groups that had already reserved space there, through the partnership, we added that, those lights temporarily. Mm -hmm. If we were to do it again, and our plan is not to do it in the fall, we would go ahead and do a, a study. And we've also investigated adding, adding two more sticks to eliminate that factor. So we recognize that as a board. Great. Thank you. Sure. Oh, and there was a question is, uh, about EMC. Is how is it zoned? I would have to defer that question because I'm not sure. Okay. It's zoned residential. Residential zone. B, I believe. Okay. So this would, the lighting wouldn't affect that zoning? The lighting would be permitted. It would be permitted. Our next topic would be the construction waste debris bylaw, and we're looking for a brief overview and rationale for this bylaw. Ms. Nickerson, you have to answer this question. <laughs> Do we have somebody here that can? So the construction uh, debris bylaw, or the nuisance bylaw, I think it might be yes. termed actually uh, on the ballot or uh, on the warrant, that's designed to try and um, sort of prevent the mass gathering of junk in certain lots around town. Uh, it's not intended, uh, I think the first version that came out kind of got into every detail and said if your grass wasn't three and a half inches tall, you're going to get a fine because we wanted it three inches tall, whatever. You know, so there was a, a pretty extensive draft that first came forward. Uh, I think the town manager's office has gone through and cleaned that up with the input from some of the selectmen uh, and others to try and make it a little bit more um, broad and appealing and not as sort of punitive. Uh, the intent is to try and discourage and, certain, and frankly not allow you know, junkyards to, to happen in town. There's neighborhoods in Hopkinton today where you've got beautiful homes where valued at $500, $600, 800000000 million. And next to that, there are lots where there's all kinds of stuff. And that stuff can be a hazard. That stuff can be dangerous to kids. And so while people have property rights, and I, I respect people's rights to own property and, and do as they please, as do my colleagues, uh, there's also you know, the rights of your neighbors. And if you have a million dollar home and somebody next door is piling up all kinds of junk and the people and you're trying to sell your million dollar home and you can only sell it for 800 G's because something happened next door, that's impacting your rights. So we're trying to find a balancing um, line there, if you will, that allows people to 
um, maintain their properties, but also m make sure that those around them are going to do the same. And if passed, will this be citizen patrolled? <laughs> Barney Fife will come by every now and then, <laughs> citizens arrest, and he'll take care of it. No, we're going to have a, a committee. I think the bylaw calls out, or the proposed bylaw calls out for uh, a member of the Board of Selectmen, uh, the town manager's office, I think, a member of the planning board, building inspector, building inspector and, the and the police chief to gather uh, so from across the community to listen to the concerns of those that bring some, you know, bring an issue to their attention, and then we try to sort out the best solution for it. We've tried to work through a couple of these things already. As, as the chair, I've spent, uh, I've been a chair a few times now, but over the years I've spent plenty of time going to various neighborhoods in town and talking to people and trying to find a way to, to sort of, you know, create a little deal that people will work together to clean up some property. Uh, and it's hard to do because there's not a lot of teeth in our current bylaws for that. So a follow-up to that, and you miss maybe part of the discussion, but, you know, a lot of people own property that's part of the wooded area or um, like somebody suggested specifically like the buffer zones between properties. Would that be still a citizen's responsibility or would that be considered under town? Uh, I can't answer that. I'm let Mr. Kamal take a look at that one. I, I don't believe we have buffer zones per se. Um, if, if you're referring to additional vacant land on property that is already owned by somebody, if the, if the construction debris, just to be clear, um, the selectmen have narrowed this bylaw revision to two aspects. The first aspect is there is an existing bylaw regarding unregistered vehicles. That bylaw, unfortunately, does not specify the enforcing authority. Thus, the proposed change at town meeting will identify the enforcing authority for that bylaw. The second piece relates to construction debris that is brought to a property from somewhere else. So if your question is, if there is construction debris brought from outside and placed in an undeveloped portion of an existing parcel uh, that is viewable from uh, the public right of way, then this bylaw will apply. Okay. Thank you. And the last question about this is, does this bylaw, is it for town land as well? Does it apply to town land? Yes. Okay. Okay, we are getting a couple of emails coming in or Facebook messages uh, specific about the kennel bylaws. Uh, this replaces our current kennel bylaw with more thorough and stringent wording. Um, is doggy daycare included? How does this impact smaller daycares and pet sitters? I'll hold off on the next question. I'll let you sit on that. So the proposed kennel bylaw uh, applies to people who currently are required to get kennel licenses. Uh, it tracks the state statute. So uh, it puts down in the town bylaws what state statute already requires. So it doesn't affect dog daycares, uh, which are already covered under another bylaw. And um, anyone who's currently required to get a kennel license, whether it be a commercial kennel, a boarding kennel, or a personal kennel, uh, would still be required to get a kennel license if this bylaw passes. Um, so it doesn't affect dog daycare unless they already need to get a kennel license today. Okay, and the second question is, who is consulted in the new wording of this bylaw? The, um, there was an initial draft um, that I prepared based on a review of other uh, bylaws around town. I sent a copy to uh, everyone who received a kennel license in 2016 and asked for their feedback. Uh, we did hear from one uh, entity that does have a kennel license with some very good comments. Uh, it's been available for a public review, uh, posted a um, link to the Board of Selectmen's website uh, and agendas. And so uh, feedback at meetings and um, sought from existing kennel licensees. 
Oh, as well as from the state. I did consult the State mm. Department of Agricultural Resources as well, who um, said that uh, they thought it was a good bylaw. So I think this is a follow-up to that. Um, an emailed question asked uh, related to Article 56, lease to animal shelter at Fruit Street property. Um, I guess the question is where specifically would this animal shelter be located at the Fruit Street property? So we do have a slide that shows parcel eight on the Fruit Street property, uh, the plan that was approved by town meeting in 2015. And parcel eight is about 30 acres of undesignated land. It wasn't set aside for any particular municipal use. Um, originally, when the town purchased the property, there was a thought that the town might sell it for housing development. Um, in 2014 and 15, there was a review of the Fruit Street plan and was decided to retain that for potential use that might come along in the future um, and would be entertained at, that, at this time. So at this time, um, there's a couple of potential uses for consideration for this parcel eight in the, in the, along Fruit Street, about 30 acres. So it's available for multiple uses and not just one. Thank you. Okay, we now have some interest about the temporary mori moratorium on non-medical marijuana establishments. I was wondering if you could enlighten us on that. So the planning board has put forth um, essentially a moratorium is a pause button on making decisions about having recreational marijuana dispensaries in town. And that will expire in August of 2018, at which time the town will need to make some decisions about what to do next. Okay. Uh, can you please explain what types of establishments that this would apply to? So it applies to recreational marijuana dispensaries. Okay. You answered all those questions. Excellent. Um, so our next article, Article 24, is the Hayden Road traffic calming. Um, for $1,050,000, we'll add traffic calming measures on Hayden Road near the high school, middle school, EMC Park, the new Marathon School, and Chestnut Street intersections. Could you please briefly explain the proposal? Uh, and I believe we have the plan up here. Uh, and why it is needed. Yes. Okay. We will hold on that question. So again, if there are any audience questions, feel free to come up to the mic. So an emailed question is related to Article 41, um, saying, is a long overdue bylaw to make minutes available online in a timely fashion? This is a transparency issue and is important. Um, and so he's asking, the problem with it is, I'm, if I'm reading it correctly, is that there's a delay of 50 days between the meeting and the posting of the minutes. The committee has 40 days to approve the minutes and then 10 days to get them to the town clerk. There will probably be a small delay after that too. So the first question he asked is, am I right that citizens won't see the minutes until 50 days, nearly two months after a meeting? And his follow-up question is, can we do better? Uh, yes. Um, this bylaw has been discussed in public uh, at the Board of Selectmen meetings. And one of the issues discussed is specifically the calendar days by which the minutes are to be produced. What was taken into consideration in arriving at the 40-day calendar days of the meeting as the date by which the minutes are to be published was basically the consideration that some boards and committees in town do not have staff support. And we believe that 40 days gives them, especially the boards that don't have staff support, enough time to produce the minutes. Thank you. 
from my experience, Maria Glynn at the town uh, hall or the fire station now is a very busy woman, especially with all my emails. Um, the next subject matter is the middle school auditorium. Um, we've got an article for 162000 for upgrades to the HVA system. We approved 167000 at annual town meeting 2016 for this auditorium improvements, and we're just wondering why the new fee. So I got this question in advance, thank you very much, and was able to get the, uh, I'm going to read the answer. There's $88,000 remaining from the original May 2016 appropriation of 167000 the amount spent on that article, 79000 represents 47% of the total appropriation. It was spent on upgrades to the stage, which was always the plan. So the plan for the entire article included upgrades to the stage, including lighting, rigging, curtains, and the floor. Um, when it came to the part of the plan to replace the air conditioning, it became very clear that we did not have enough funds and that it was going to cost a lot more. The, the initial... Um, estimates were based on an, uh, the Habib report, um, and when we came to do the work, it was going to be significantly more. Um, so the remaining amount was not touched. It is still there. Uh, the additional 125000 is being asked to complete the work, which is specifically the air conditioning. But... So the thing that I'm a little confused about is that that actually was voted by the school committee not to be put forth this year as a capital article. So it is not um, on the warrant for this town meeting. Oh, it's not? No. It was. Okay. Well, it was. It was, but it no longer is, okay. and it will not be put forth at town meeting next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's on the draft. Okay. okay. Thank you for clearing that up. Sorry, I'm jumping in again. Uh, I got another email question. Jumping around, sorry. You guys good with the jumping around? All right, so I have a question back to the EMC lights. I like to read it verbatim so that the, it gets the right thing across. So it says, regarding lights at the EMC park for 250000 I think I heard the gentleman say that the Little League enrollment has been rising, and that is part of the need for lights. So his two questions are, one, is this true? I heard that with the growing popularity of lacrosse and spring soccer, Hopkinton Little League is happy that they have been holding steady for maybe just slightly slipping in enrollment. Two, to be clear, is Hopkinton Little League in favor of this article? Are they, offer, are they officially endorsing it? The answer to both questions are yes. The last report we received from Little League is increased by 3%. Not a big increase but it was large in part the intent of Little League and Park and Rec to put lights on those fields in the first place, but in respect to the abutters, we didn't. Mm -hmm. And we are fully in support of Little League, um, and they're actually helping manage the right lights in the installation. And again, it's in conjunction with the Marathon School and the sharing of that parking lot. Okay. We might have to go back to that. I think they're still typing. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, we're going to talk about alcohol sales in town buildings. Um, I'm just wondering how this article came about and what it's for. Put simply, the request for the article came about in response to the realization or recognition that for the first time in many, many years, the town will be bringing online two new facilities, the DPW, the library. There were specific requests from non-profit organizations in town to see how they could usher in these two facilities. So as far as the liquor license? The... The thought process um, is around halting um, the key opening events as well as prospective fundraising events. As you can read in, yes, with the one day liquor license, any nonprofit that will be undertaking any beer sales in a town facility 
will be required to apply for an alcohol license. It's a one-day alcohol license. And two, the event must specifically benefit community Hopkinton. And three, the hours of operation will have to comply with the town's hours for operating alcohol establishments. Okay. Thank you. So we've had some interest on Facebook about the Fruit Street property and its leasing to youth organizations. Will this allow the town to lease a portion of the Fruit Street property to a nonprofit youth organization that wins a competitive bid selection process? Is there a certain group in mind for this land? I'm assuming the question is in relation to the Scouts Association. It could be. They also follow up with Pratt Farm land was also purchased originally for scout building on or near Fruit Street. Is this the same property or is this? It's the same entity, but there are two properties that are raised by your two questions. As you may recall, when the town purchased the Pratt Farm there was a restriction that was put in place by the seller, namely that a portion of the platform would be set aside for building a scouting lodge. Mm -hmm. Subsequent to that, the Board of Selectmen formed a study committee to look at the potential uses to be placed or located on the platform parcel. As part of that process, the Scouting Association also undertook a feasibility study to see exactly where they could locate the lodge. Simultaneously, the town undertook a water source study, evaluating where, as you remember, during the town meeting approval for this parcel, a potential well could be located. The results of those two studies basically eliminated the opportunity to locate a scouting lodge on the farm. And thus, the request now coming before town meeting is to see if town meeting will agree to allow a scouting lodge to be built on the adjoining Fruit Street parcel. Okay. So <clears throat> the question is, will the... Are we calling it a scout lodge? Yes. Okay. So will the scout lodge for the youth organization is at the same parcel of land um, on Fruit Street as the animal shelter? Is that the right question? Section 8. Yeah. yeah. Parcel 8. Parcel 8. Yes. So it's the same parcel? Yes. Okay. Is that going to be any problem with that? It's our understanding that neither organization would require more than five acres, and so there's plenty of land for both. Perfect. Thank you. So what do we do with the Pratt Farm now? Yes, water and recreation, including trails. Okay. Thank you. Our next subject would be the senior citizen's tax exemption. And how is this different? than what we currently have in place, and what is the reason for the change? I'll answer the questions in the reverse. The reason for the change is twofold. At, I believe, the last two annual town meetings, there has been a specific request for the selectmen and town hall to look into opportunities for mitigating the tax impact owing to some of our recent uh, purchases on seniors. So there has been a specific request that we look into opportunities to mitigate the tax impact. And secondly, there have also been changes in the laws that we absolutely feel um, present an opportunity uh, for the town to mitigate some of the tax increases on seniors. Thus, specifically, there are two proposals that are coming forth at town meeting. 
the first proposal identifies an opportunity to allow for a tax exemption when people add or renovate their homes to accommodate seniors. Secondly, the means tested senior property tax exemption will allow the selectmen to identify additional opportunities to provide tax relief for seniors. For example, the town may be moving forward a significant project with a substantial tax impact on seniors and every year using means tested formula the selectmen may establish a number i.e. a dollar number that they can exempt the seniors um, relative to any specific project or any specific tax increase identified that particular year. Uh, we have a question about uh, the ballot question, and that is um, charter amendments. Why are we voting on this again? We discussed and voted on this at special town meeting earlier this year. Has anything changed since then, or is it simply a required second vote? In, in fact, the, the charter review committee chair is present, and with your permission, she may answer the question. Put simply, there were three steps identified for the charter review process. First step was a voted town meeting. Second step was sending the town meeting vote for review by the state's legal counsel, attorney general's office. And then the state third step following a successful review by the attorney general's office is a ballot question, and that is standard for any charter review uh, process. Thank you. So anything to add? This is wax lax. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, ballot question number two. What is the rationale for making constable an appointed position, position versus an elected position? Why does this town need a constable? Or what does the constable do? We have a special mic right up there for you. I'm so glad I came too. Um, so during the charter review process, we did find that there are both appointed and elected constables at um, within the town of Hopkinton. There is no specific bylaw, and I'm sorry I'm doing this off the top of my head. There's no specific bylaw related to the constables. Um, within the town bylaws, there's nothing really in mass general laws in terms of you have to have appointed. What this does is this codifies the constables within our town bylaws so that there's a definite rationale or, or knowledge of what we are supposed to be doing. Okay. Thank you. Good job. Good. You may sit down now. Okay, uh, we had a question about Hopkinton Day, and uh, what is it, and uh, how much would it cost? What are the funds that would be allocated to it? So this comes off the very successful, I think wildly successful, 300th anniversary celebration we had in September of 2015. It sort of culminated in September of 2015 when we had the big uh, carnival and all the different activities outside here on the school property and then we had the fireworks at night and uh, it was just a great day a great weekend the whole year was a great celebration but it really came together that day and a lot of folks uh, in town young and old those that have lived here their entire lives and those that moved here six months ago uh, prior to that uh, everyone loved it and asked if we was if there's a way that we can try to continue that or something uh, you know, like that uh, for years to come. So that is the, the concept around Hopkinton Day. Uh, it's done all over Massachusetts. Uh, I have spent a lot of time going to all these different events over around Massachusetts the last few years. And uh, I think if we can try it here in Hopkinton, it would be great. Uh, the budget number set aside included in this year's budget uh, submission to town meeting, or when we get to that point, uh, is $30,000, if my memory serves me correctly. And that would include some form of a fireworks display. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
Uh, we've got a question about CPC funding. And it's 55000 for a shared use trail on the Hughes property. Uh, the article says there will be a dog park on the property, yet no dogs will be allowed on the trail. Is this correct? I think it's that no dogs would be allowed off the trail, so that dogs would have to be leashed and stay on the, on the path. Okay. Except, of course, within the dog park where they could <laughs> run around. So they will be able to get to the dog yes. park. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and the Fruit Street property, the lease to animal shelter or hospital, would allow the Board of Selectmen to lease a portion of the Fruit Street property to an animal hospital or shelter. We might have addressed this a little bit. Uh, what is the reason for this? Or are we anticipating a new shelter? The town has received interest from um, a local animal shelter in looking for a new location, and they were interested in pursuing the land here um, on Fruit Street, and so it's an opportunity for the town to consider that request and whether that's something that we want to accommodate there. Okay. We've got a question about speed limits, uh, which I think we will then again address again. John's walking in the building. <laughs> Perfect timing. Let me let him get in the in the room. <laughs> uh, what didn't all traffic coming? Uh, this is about local speed limits. If we want to give him a minute, um, setting speed limits to twenty-five miles per hour. This would allow the Board of Selectmen to establish 25 miles per hour speed limits on any roadway inside a thickly settled or business district that is not a state highway without authorization from the state. How is this different from our current rules and regulations? Am I putting you right on the spot? Sure. Um, <laughs> good evening again. So currently, the only way to change a speed limit is to do an engineering study and that has to be reviewed and approved by Massachusetts Department of Transportation, MassDOT. What the new law will allow the town to do is to greatly modify and streamline how that process is changed. So the town will be able to identify the areas that it wants to change the speed limit and it's a much more streamlined process. However, that new law will not apply to areas that have a regulated speed limit. And what that means is, uh, excuse me, a registered speed limit. What that means is that there are certain roads in town that are registered with the Mass DOT with a certain speed limit. So those are not affected by the new laws. So what has to happen there is the same old process of you have to do a speed study, an engineering speed study, and it's going to be reviewed and approved by MassDOT. And is it true if the speed study figures that the speed limit should be higher, then it could be set higher? It's rather archaic, isn't it? Yes. And uh, so what they do is there's, there's a lot of components that go into that speed study. One of the things, one of the primary things that they look at is the 85th percentile of the speed that motorists are traveling on that roadway. So a speed study is done, and they look at what 85% of the people are traveling at. What's that maximum speed? So let's say, for example, you have a road that posted speed limit's 30, but the 85th percentile of people are traveling, traveling at 40. Then the speed study would dictate that that speed limit should be increased to 40. And the way that that works is that they look at primarily how comfortable people are driving on that roadway, regardless of what the conditions are, where they are, if it's, in a, if it's around schools, but how comfortable people are driving on that roadway. And that is uh, primarily, that's derived from the width of the road, the alignment of the road, how many, how many homes there are on the road. So 85th percentile may, may increase speeds on roads. 
Does that speed study include the number of accidents that happen on the road? It, it looks at the number of accidents. It's, it looks at the traffic volumes. It looks like at the traffic speeds. You, engineers have to, have to actually drive the roadway. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into it. But one of the, one of the primary determining factors is that 85th percentile. Right. Okay, so we're going to move on to Article 24, the Hayden Road traffic calming. Um, the first question is, could you please briefly explain the proposal and show the plan and see what is needed? It was mentioned earlier that one of the components is improvements out in front of the schools here. And that is, in fact, the case. Is that the only slide that we have? Um, the one that would show the ha Hayden Road traffic calming overview, perhaps? Um, so there are, there are two capital improvements that are proposed. The first is something that was looked at by town meeting a couple of years ago, and it was denied. It was $400,000 to change the configuration of Hayden Row as it exists in front of the middle school, the high school, and Hopkins School. That was not approved, so it was not done. However, the problem hasn't gone away. It's only gotten worse on Hayden Row, um, and it's the, the conditions around this corridor are going to get more complex as Marathon School opens. So what the engineers have come up with is many different components traffic calming components that in their aggregate will help to improve the safety for motorists and pedestrians in this corridor. So what we've got here is the top panel on the far right hand side that if you slide it down there's, there should be a match line. So we're looking at the top panel on the left is the tennis courts in the intersection of Grove and Hayden Row. It travels towards Milford and then we hop down to the bottom panel and we come up to the intersection of Chestnut Street. So the two major capital components, one is the changes in the configuration out in front of the schools. And Amy, do you have the one that says Hayden Road traffic calming middle school, high school segment? Please. What this will provide is um, it will provide, right now there are, in effect, four travel lanes out there. There are two travel lanes and two very wide shoulders, so motorists use those for, for passing vehicles that are waiting to turn left into the schools. So what this will do is to, it will add a left-hand turn lane for motorists that are traveling north, and that left-hand turn lane will allow them to safely sit and wait, and it will allow motorists to pass to the right-hand side to get through. Um, it narrows, if we look at the left-hand side of the slide, the, the, the bright green, that is a, a narrowing of the travel way. And then you'll see just in front of the school entrance, there is an island that will either be a scored island or, or perhaps a raised island. But what this is going to require motorists to do is they've got to move to the right and then to the left again. So that is one very small piece of, of this. As they travel to the south, you'll see to the right of the school entrance for Hopkins School, there's another one of those narrowing of the shoulders, and there's a center island. So that's just the first component that motorists will hit as they're moving down. Um, do you happen to have the one that shows the elementary school? Please. Uh, as motorists continue down the roadway, that one's fine right there as well. Thank you. Um, at the EMC, actually, if you go back, that was a better one. No, I'm sorry. If you go back, uh, yep, uh, at the EMC crosswalk where there was the, the accident, uh, we're, we're going to be installing re uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, and those are going to be push button for pedestrians that will flash back and forth. You continue traveling down, you're going to come upon the elementary school, and there are, uh, there's a left-hand turn lane for motorists that are traveling southerly that will be able to turn into the school. Um, the next item, and I'm just remember you're going to ask me to be brief. The next item moving down is a radar feedback sign. That's one that posted speed will be there. And if, you're, if you exceed that, it will flash your speed limit. Uh, continuing down, 
The next major component is the Chestnut Street intersection. There should be a slide on that. Uh, this is $650,000 for the design and construction of a new signal. And if you look, what we're doing is we're providing a left and a right-hand turn lane on Chestnut Street. Uh, for the folks that are traveling southerly towards Milford, there is a dedicated left-hand turn lane. And for those folks that are traveling northerly, there's another one of those proposed gateway treatments where we narrow the shoulder and we put a, a center island. So all of these things in their aggregate, the work out in front of the schools, the flashing beacon, the new elementary school driveway, uh, the, the signal here, this will provide for traffic calming. People will have to drive slower because right now it's a straight corridor. People just get on it and there's nothing really to slow them down, unfortunately. But all of these elements combined in their aggregate will provide for a safer corridor. Okay, Amy, if we can go back to the slide where you can see all of Hayden Row. Um, we've got a prepared question. We've also got a Facebook question, and it's for Dr. McLeod. And is there a new system for queuing the cars once the new school is on this road. Will you redesign the queuing for the middle school, high school, or any of them? Did you want to f wait for the slide? Is this the slide you were looking for? W would this help? Or do you? The, the sli so the slide that shows the front of the schools where the, um, the four lanes that John was describing would help, because that can show the queuing system. Middle school, high school segment, there it is. Right there. So uh, I think what the individual who's asking the question is referring to is that currently um, the system that we have in place it includes having cars queuing up in front of the tennis courts. Um, and that had been something that, that had been jointly designed, um, you know, a few years ago when there was very little in place. So this was a, you know, a measure that was improving safety, at least somewhat. Um, and it does tend to be a period of time that lasts from 20 minutes to half an hour, particularly at the end of the day, the, the beginning of the day, not so much. But at the end of the day, when parents are in front of the high school queuing up to pick up students, um, there is definitely um, a line there. So the question had to do with if this traffic calming were to be approved, would there be alter an alternative space for queuing? And this is a conversation that I've had with Mr. Westerling um, and, and with um, Chief Lee in terms of um, something that we would really have to study. There are some um, options that we have looked at within the parking lot, um, but have not really explored in detail, and, but we believe could be uh, some solutions within that area. Um, it would certainly take some study and lots of planning because you, you know a lot of this is habitual, right? So people are used to it being a certain way and it wouldn't be something that we would be able to change immediately. So along with the plan would be a lot of pl uh, studying that would have to take place in, st in terms of what would be an uh, alternative queuing system, what would that mean to traffic flow within the parking lots, but we believe that there, there are a couple of potential solutions that would address and provide opportunities for safely queuing cars. And the queuing process that you have in place for the new school is on that property. That will not affect Hayden Road? It's unrelated. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question in the draft warrant, there was an article proposing a sidewalk on the east side of Hayden Row, the M EMC Park side, from the new school to Chestnut. It didn't make the final warrant. Is this being dropped for now? Why? <clears throat> We had a proposal for $1.6 million worth of sidewalks, and that included sidewalks on the east side of Hayden Row from the current terminus at EMC Park down to Chestnut Street. There were sidewalks along West Main Street from Price Chopper uh, up to Lumber Street and a couple of other small components. This year was not the year in the budget to be able to accomplish that work, so that was parked until next year. Uh, there was an erroneous draft warrant article that did show just this sidewalk on the easterly side of Chestnut, of excuse me, Hayden Row. It was removed because it was in error. But we do have engineering design funds that were appropriated last year at town meeting. So what we're going to do is to design the sidewalk for this section, 
so that when the, uh, in the eventuality that funds are appropriated, that will have the design, we can put it right out to bid and we can get that constructed July 1st. Okay. And there is a um, citizen's petition for a sidewalk on Chestnut Street. If that were to pass at town meeting, would that affect this stretch of sidewalk that you just spoke about? Uh, no. No. Okay. No. Uh, that would run from uh, Chestnut Street at that intersection where the new signal is. There, there's some sidewalk there. And it would run down into into the neighborhoods, but that is a citizen petition, so I don't have any further details. Okay. Um, we did have a write-in earlier today. Um, will calming measures also be discussed for side streets? And this is specifically um, Granite and Lumber Street. The impact of the additional traffic due to the building at the end of Lumber Street that's had on granite going to the schools. And is that going to be part of your study? The engineers are completing a $40,000 study, partially funded by the school department, partially funded by uh, the town. And that looks at the entire corridor from Grove Street to the Milford Line and uh, along Hayden Row. And they'll be looking at all of the intersecting roadways along there and making recommendations for anything that can improve the flow of traffic into and out of those intersections. There are no, there are no widenings of those intersections like we saw proposed for Chestnut Street, but any elements that will improve sight distance or signage or anything like that, those are going to be recommended as well. Okay. At this time, I would like to ask if there are any audience questions about this traffic calming that we're speaking about right now. Excellent. You have an email. So a follow-up email question, um, I think, is what they're asking is all these proposed turn lanes on Hayden Row, um, they're asking why this wasn't at part of the original Marathon School building plan. Why wasn't that included in the cost of the new school? The, the new school uh, where you see elementary school intersection reconstruction, that is all being paid for through the elementary school reconstruction. Hmm. The, the investigation of the signal and the work up in front of the high school, that's really beyond the limits of that marathon school. So the million, 50,000, some of that's not part of it or uh the million fifty thousand is comprised of two elements one is four hundred thousand dollars worth of design and construction in front of the middle school the high school and hopkins school and six hundred and fifty thousand dollars of that is the design and construction of the intersection in the new signal at chestnut street okay the other work that's being done at the marathon school again is part of the marathon school construction and will be completed in advance of of this work okay thank you for that clarification another question was um someone was under the impression that part of the new school cost would also include a traffic light at the entrance to marathon school is that still happening Mr. Shepard is here. He has just come from an ESBC meeting. So it was in, then it was out, so I'm not sure. Mike Shepard, uh, I'm on the building committee for the school. Uh, initially, we had planned on putting a traffic light at that intersection. Um, after talking with the planning board and got recommendations from the, the, um, the people, the engineering team, they said that it wasn't an appropriate place for a traffic light. Uh, in order to... to protect the funds of the citizens, what we've done and what is included in the plan is conduit will be run under the road when and if somebody decides a traffic light will go there. But the light in and of itself is not part of the plan at this point. We'll put the wiring under the road so if somebody future. five years from now says there's a light there, it'll be there. For the future. Okay. Thank you. I think that sums up the questions that we have, and our Facebook questions have slowed down. Um, so I didn't know if the panelists had anything to say. Wait, you perked up. <laughs> I got something to say. 
uh, if you had anything to say. Otherwise, uh, Amy Vinderbush will join us back up here for closing remarks. And I thank you all for coming here tonight. We really appreciate, appreciate you taking this time out. And I hope everybody can go to town meeting and just vote really quickly because we all have no questions. <laughs>thank you all for coming now that we've wrapped up the question and answer portion of the night we'd like to encourage viewers to stay in the know by subscribing to our e-newsletter we had a sign-in sheet at the door and following us on facebook twitter and instagram we'll be sending out additional information about all the town meeting articles later this week as we prepare for town meeting next monday including our annual town meeting 101 which is geared towards people who have never attended before we'll also be posting the town meeting results to our website and to social media live from the meeting um, thank you all for attending um, and thank you to the school, the schools in the town for the use of the high school library. Thank you to HCAM for all their work behind the scenes. Thank you to all of our panelists. And of course, thank you to the EHOP board for working behind the scenes to make the forum possible. All right, so it's our tradition here at Know Your Vote to take guesses from our panelists on how long they think town meeting will last this year. <laughs> and we're asking for the estimated number of nights and the time the meeting will adjourn on the final evening. And the panelist who is closest without going over will get the honor of sending out a flock of EHOP flamingos to the lawn of a friend or enemy <laughs> of their choosing in the middle of the night early in July. All right, so we, you know, who wants to go first? <laughs> Mr. Gary Beating, do you have a guess? You should be the one most I'm likely to. Yeah. I was like to control. Uh, <laughs> uh, writing it down? Tuesday night, 11 10 p.m. I think Tuesday night, when you said 11, 10, I think 11, 20. He's not allowed to go over it. I'll go with Tuesday at midnight. Oh. <laughs> You're determined to get done on two nights, huh? Tuesday at 9 o'clock. going to be the one to say Wednesday, but um, <laughs> there are how many articles on this? <laughs> 63, <laughs> which is more than last year. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going Wednesday at 8.30. <laughs> Tuesday at 10.05. Tuesday, 9.30. Okay, and it will be Tuesday at 10.59. <laughs> That concludes. So thank you all. Have a good night, and we will see you at town meeting next week.